Hello. This video is going to be about porous media and the fluids within a porous media. So let's, let's start. I've got here maybe not the most typical rock when we look for underground storage or water resources, oil and gas, um, but it is illustrative. This is a coral, and if I show it up close, you can see here, you can see the pore spaces. You can see that there are gaps in the solid structure through which fluids can flow. And these gaps may be a few millimeters across. There's some others that are much more difficult to see. So as I zoom up, you know, they may be sub-millimeter scale. So I'm showing this sample because we can see the pores. But often if we're deep underground, we're looking at sedimentary rock that may be a few kilometers below. The grains that are comprised the rock, or indeed in this case the coral material, gets crushed together. They can also be chemical transformation. And so the typical pore sizes are much smaller, maybe tens of microns, so sub-millimeter scale. So we can't see the pore spaces with a naked eye. So what do we do? Well, we can take a sample of rock at about this size, and we could look inside the rock with x-rays. Now, X-rays have a very short wavelength. So if you have the X-ray source close to the sample, we can have resolutions of, say, a micron with standard laboratory instruments. Furthermore, if we go to a synchrotron, where we have electrons that are zooming around in a circle near the speed of light, and we have a very bright beam of X-rays, we can take three-dimensional images of the rock and the fluids within the rock every minute or so. And this will be a billion voxel image, so a thousand by a thousand every minute. So let's illustrate some of these pictures and then also relate it to the more fundamental things that we've already introduced in terms of contact angle and interfacial curvature. So to do that, we're going to show some slides, of course. Okay, so here we have some slides where the red is oil. And the rock and the water have been rendered transparent so that you just see the oil, so it's a lot clearer. So if we do this now in the video, you can see that the oil, the red, seems to be pushed out here. That's a displacement process. The water is displacing the oil. So we can see that in that video sequence there on the left. Okay. Now, now let's look a little bit more closely at this. First of all, the scale, right? So the whole piece of the image here is no more than a micro, uh, sorry, a millimeter across. So we're looking at sub micron scale pores. This happens to be a limestone, an oolite actually with large carbonate grains, relatively large gaps um, between those grains in which the fluids reside. But now let's look at how the oil is configured in the pore space. This is a carbonate, a clean carbonate. The water actually has an affinity for the solid surface. What this means then is the water is the wetting phase. The oil is non-wetting. The contact angles, which we're gonna show later, are less than 90 degrees. But it also means that the oil, if we look here at the curvature, the oil is bulging out into the water. It tries to stay away from the solid surface, and it does so by bulging out, pushing into the water. It is at a higher pressure than the water. So the blue pressure is positive, the oil pressure is higher than the water pressure. Water pressure is lower. Like in a previous video when I showed water rising up into a tissue, the water is at a lower pressure because it likes the solid surface. Okay, so this is a clean piece of rock. These are rapid images taken, in this case, every 38 seconds. Now let's look at a real reservoir. So what we got here are pictures of a small piece of rock, okay, just a few, about six millimeters across and a few centimeters long, taken from a reservoir deep underground in the Middle East. But this reservoir has had crude oil sitting there in the pore spaces for geological time, for millions of years. Surface active components of the crude oil can stick to the surface, and that makes that surface a bit more oily. And if it makes it a bit more oily, then that's a bit more oil wet. So here is a two-dimensional cross-section here um, of the rock. And this is after I've injected water to displace the oil. But now it's the oil that's the wetting phase. So the oil is now clinging 
to the nooks and crannies of the pore space in the little pores where it likes coating the surface. The water goes into the centers of the bigger pores, the water in blue here. And now if we blow up the image and actually the raw image, this has been segmented so that we've got nice colors. Okay, the raw image here, this is the water phase shown in gray. The oil is actually black. It doesn't absorb x-rays so strongly. And we see here that the water is bulging out into the oil. It's the other way around. So the oil is non-wetting, it's at a higher pressure. And the contact angle is now greater than 90 degrees. Now, if you're interested in this in more detail, the work has been published and all the images, and in fact, some of the codes to analyze uh, these images have been placed in the public domain. And you can see uh, the uh, websites there. But what about contact angle itself? So here we have a picture. Again, this is this oolithic limestone. This is a couple of millimeters across. And we're just scanning through. This is an image, and we're just sort of scanning through the image of the rock. So the rock, the solid, is in red, and the pore space of the gaps between the solids. So that's what we're really talking about. And what we're showing here are blobs of carbon dioxide. So we've injected carbon dioxide into this rock at high pressure and then displaced with water. And the carbon dioxide, the non-wetting phase, it's sitting in the large pores with this curvature of the bulges outwards. So we've taken here just a blob, one of the blobs of carbon dioxide. We're now looking at the sub-millimeter scale. And uh, it's shown in orange for no particular reason, just uh, for illustrative purposes. What we're seeing here is now we're zooming through it. Actually, the gray is the carbon dioxide, the blue is water, and the red is the sun. Now we want to look at contact angle as well as curvature. We can see the curvature is sort of bulging out of the CO2 brine interface. But the yellow is the three-phase contact angle, where the two phases hit the solid surface. We take a plane that's perpendicular to that solid surface. Okay. So it's perpendicular to that uh, three-phase contact line. We're sort of zooming around in space here. Okay. And the contact angle is actually measured now on that plane. Now let's look at this carefully. This is the solid. This is the brine. Actually, it's salty water. And this is the carbon dioxide. Here we have a contact angle which is measured through the carbon dioxide. If we measure the contact angle through the brine, which would be normally, then this is a contact angle about 45 degrees. The water is the wetting phase. It likes the surface. The carbon dioxide has less interaction with the solid. It's the non-wetting phase. It has a curvature of the bulges out into the water. So from the young Laplace equation, it's at a higher pressure. From the young equation, we have a contact angle that's less than 90 degrees. Okay. Now let's go back to that reservoir sample. The reservoir samples we showed where we've had crude oil in the pore space of the rock. That's not going to be so watery. So what we have here is a graph that shows the distribution of contact angle. Okay. The blue curve is something that's a bit water wet. Actually, it's a piece of rock where we put in the crude oil, but we didn't wait. And so it's weakly water wet. The contact angles are just slightly less than 90 degrees. The vertical line is where we take a flat calcite surface and we measure the contact angle. And we get something that's sort of in the middle of the distribution. But you then might say, well, why is there a distribution? Well, because of course, the real surface in the rock is a rough surface. And when we look at contact angles on a rough surface, we can see a range of effective angle. So we see a range of angle because we're looking at a rough surface. When we have these two other systems where we put crude oil into the rock, actually two different crude oils at different conditions, and we've waited a long time so that the surface active components can stick, what we see is larger contact angles, one system with a range of contact angles that are around 90 degrees, one with a range of contact angles that are a little bit higher. Again, the solid, the, the vertical lines are what we measure on a flat surface. On a flat surface now, the contact angles tend to be larger. Why? Because when we put the crude oil into the rock, there's water initially present. The water initially is, water, is, is wetting. It likes the clean surface. So the water is retained in the nooks and crannies and the roughness of the pore space. So there is some water initially present. So the oil, it doesn't contact all the solid surface. And so the effective angle, when we look at actually how water then moves across this surface that's rough, but also contains a little bit of water originally, we actually see effective angles that are lower and a range of angle, not just one angle. 
So this is what we typically see underground. We actually see a range of contact angles. We can now with X-ray imaging actually see this for the first time. And this is very recent. This is, this is work that's only been done over the last couple of years. But that's about reservoir rocks. More generally, we can look at curvature and interfaces for a wide range of different applications. So I've got a picture of the pair and the picture down below because those are nicely illustrative of cases where you have radii of curvature that are different sides. So a pair has a curvature like this, but it also has a curvature like this. So it has two curvatures that are opposite side. And then shown here is looking at soap bubbles. So far, it was quite interesting. Here we have an interface, right, which is stabilized by a surfactant. It has a very low interfacial tension. So there's relatively little energy associated with a bubble interface. That's why you have it. And if you have a bubble, okay, and one bubble meets another, you then have an interface whose overall curvature is zero because there's no pressure difference between one bubble and the next. But if you were to do a cleverer thing, and you can sometimes see this, if we have two soap bubbles in a ring, you can have an interface that's curved like this and curved in the other direction. The overall curvature, the total curvature, is actually zero. So the curvature that goes round like that is exactly matched by a curvature that goes in the opposite direction. So if you have a soap film okay, on two rings that spans the two rings, there's no pressure across the film. Okay? So there's no in the young Laplace equation, the capillary pressure is zero because it's, it's air on both sides. And so the two curvatures must exactly cancel. So you either have a flat interface, like this, or you have a curvature where the total curvature is zero. The reason why these bubbles actually do seem to have some curvature here is when you lower bubble, okay, there's a slightly higher pressure in the air, and then there's a, an interface around it. And so the pressure inside the bubble is very slightly higher. Okay, so that I think ends uh, this sequence where I've shown how we can look inside a porous medium. We can actually now look inside a piece of rock, a rock that's much tighter than this with smaller pore spaces. We can look at the wettability, we can look at the curvatures, and we can then relate that to our capillary pressures. Okay, thank you very much.